Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you may be. Uh, my name is Matthias Livis, and I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons. I would like to start this webinar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on uh, which we all work and live. For me, that is the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. Now, I'm very pleased this morning to be uh, introducing Jason Bell, a QCIF e-research analyst based at Central Queensland University. Uh, amongst other things, Jason teaches uh, software carpentry workshop, workshops virtually to uh, students all over Australia. Central Queensland University is a very, very geographically diverse organisation, uh, and Jason will tell you all about that. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Matthias. Um, well, welcome, everyone. So my name's Jason Bell, and today I'll be presenting the uh, virtual software carpentries that um, information that I've been running over the, the last few years and some of the key learnings that I've found. So before I go too far in it, for those who do not know me, my name is Jason Bell, and I'm the Senior Research Technologies Officer within the Information and Technology Directorate at CQ University Australia, but I'm also the e-research analyst for the Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation. And basically my role is I help researchers achieve better outcomes through the use of technology. And so I look after our HPC system, I look after our research storage, but I also run some training sessions. And so today I'll be focusing on some of those training sessions that I run and some of the things that I have learned from it. So I wanna start this uh, presentation off with a bit of a quote. And um, it's one of my favorite quotes and it's from Grace Hopper, the American computer scientist. And the, the most dangerous phase in the human language is we've always done it this way. And for myself, um, we found that we couldn't do face-to-face -face, uh, presentations. And, and the reason why we couldn't do that is that we're actually geographically uh, spread throughout Australia. So I'm based in uh, Rockhampton and I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners that we present on. And from myself in Rockhampton, that will be the Drumble people. Um, but we're actually spread right across Australia. And what we found was that we didn't have enough participants at a single location to run face-to-face -face sessions on a regular basis. And so because of this uh, limitation, we then looked at other means. And there is definitely a need for software carpentry training, but you know, four or five students is just not enough economically to, to try and run a session. So by doing a, a virtual session, it um, allows us to connect to all of our campuses throughout Australia. So a bit of history, um, software carpentry at CQ University. So I've been providing software carpentry workshops and lessons since uh, 2016. And as I'm the only instructor within my region and institution, I found it probably more appropriate for the audience um, and being virtual a lot simpler if I just focused on a particular topic rather than two days where it would include a bit of Unix shell, a bit of Git and a programming language, whether that would be R or Python. And I found that that's worked reasonably well because they can focus on a, a single topic. And so the sessions that I generally run um, is the Unix shell session, the plotting and programming in Python, and R for reproducible scientific analysis. So when I first started Software Carpentry, I actually ran some face-to-face -face workshops. But I found that particularly after the initial cohort that um, attended, that it was hard to get the numbers. So we face some issues. Like everything, nothing goes uh, quite smooth. Um, what I do want to say is that I'm happy to share these slides um, with anyone afterwards, so don't worry too much about writing down all the details, happy to provide them later. But some of the issues that I faced was that um, you know, people were confused by the name Software Carpentry, and because of that they didn't relate to it or understand that 
actually could help them, uh, particularly with data analysis and things like that. One of the other things that we do here, and it's something that I mandated and believe in myself, is that we offer the workshops for free. So we wanted um, as many, particularly of our CQ University uh, researchers and RHD students, to, us, to attend, and we didn't want barriers to entry. But what we found, and what I found with running the sessions, is that um, you know a number of uh, registrants would not turn up. Um, they would leave, and being virtual, they will leave halfway through the the lesson, or you know not turn up on the second day, um, or you know, not prepared for the workshop. So you'd spend time getting the software installed and everything up and running. And, and, and that really had a, a negative impact and really didn't allow me to fully capitalise and, you know, build on the, you know, to use a full two days to focus on the, the content. And, you know, we found that, you know, and, and it's my belief, a lot of these consequences um, were absent and so, because there was actually no um, you know, negative impacts if they didn't attend, um, then people would just register and so forth. So we, we had to change that. Some of the other issues that we face um, is that participants would get distracted. Like all virtual um, sessions and so forth, you know, people would get phone calls or student visits will pop in their office. You know, which meant, uh, meant that they missed some of the content. And, you know, as you're probably aware with the software carpentry material where we're teaching, uh, for instance, a programming language, there is a lot of content covered. And if you miss an error or two, that actually has a, a quite a negative impact. And what it actually um, generally occurred is that they then struggled through the rest of the, the material and some of them then just found it too hard and left. The other, um, I guess, the, the concept or the thing that um, to come up with is that it's not easily to do the, the actual sticky note um, concept um, that's used in software carpentry. So with a face-to-face -face workshop, we have these sticky notes and you'll have a green sticky note for, yep, you're on track, everything's going well, you've, you've completed the exercise, or a red uh, sticky note or something similar saying, hey, I'm stuck, I need help and people would um, to you know move around the classroom and, and help those with the, the sticky note. The only um, solution I've come up so far um, was when I ask how everyone's going, I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, as well as that, what I did find, um, particularly initially, were some people and some of the actual uh, participants said that they were going okay, but actually um, they weren't and they didn't want to admit that they were struggling and you know that actually meant that we actually lost um, some of the students. And one of the things that we found is that with online you can't have virtual helpers just wandering around checking how everyone is going. So they were some of the issues that I faced, faced and dealt with over the, the time that are running these. But that's the negative, and today I really want to talk about the positive. And what I've found, and my experiences, uh, that actually work very well um, in providing virtual software carpentry workshops. First of all, it's getting buy-in. You know, one of the biggest issues that I faced was tackling the low attendance and dropout rates. You know, people would register, but not turn up. And um, with all the workshops that I run, I, I limit the attendance to a maximum of 12 participants. Um, and so this really encourages people to uh, register early and to value their spot. And I, I do it on a um, first in, first serve basis. Um, but from this, I actually had quite a number of students um, that would then miss out and go on a waiting list. And what we found is if people didn't turn up, it really meant that others that could have actually joined um, were unable to attend. So what um, I guess I've mandated now and um, quite strongly have uh, highlighted in my communications with uh, um, the possible participants is that 
you know, they um, if they do not t um, turn up or attend the entire training, they actually forfeit uh, their spot for any future training held by the CQ University e-research support. Uh, so, which is basically me. I won't uh, provide any training for these people. Now, obviously, there's always extinguishing circumstances and things like that, but I mandate that, hey, you've got to let me know within 48 hours because those people on the waiting list could actually fill your spot. Um, as well as that, um, time wasters. I've, I've been to a number of software carpentry workshops where we find within the the first 30 minutes is spent getting everyone up and running, making sure they've got the software installed and you know they're connected to the Wi-Fi and, and things like that. But as a solo presenter, um, that you know 95% of all the sessions that I've run, I've done it by myself with no helpers. I can't afford to waste that time fixing individual users when they first get started. So, as well as that, um, you know, I also mandate that not only do you must you attend, but you've got to have everything actually installed and up and running prior to starting. Because, you know, at nine o'clock when I generally start these sessions, I want to be going through the material and going through the lesson because there is a lot of content to um, cover, and I find the more that we can cover, the better. So. Again, you know, I, I set the, you know, the concept that I'll blacklist users if they uh, tend um, and they have issues and so forth, and I just flat out refuse to, to help them. I know that's negative, but in my opinion, they should have contacted uh, myself earlier prior to that. So by having this, I guess, blacklist um, participants, it actually has been a very uh, powerful incentive. As a result, um, I haven't actually had to blacklist anyone to date, and the threat alone has seen that I've achieved over 85% attendance rate. And only um, one or two that have missed it have been through uh, valid reasons. So. And not only that, I get uh, participants now contacting me early, letting me know they've got everything installed and ready to go, and you know it allows me to hit the ground running. So I found this to work um, very well with uh, my colleagues and my researchers. At other um, software carpentry, I heard that some people put a small nominal fee, um, which generally might cover morning teas, but it means that if you pay something, it's valued and, and it's considered important. And so I find with the threat of blacklisting and they know that there is only a small number of people that can participate, um, I find that that works very well. So that really enabled us to, to get good buy-in. And, and so I'm actually running and two software carpentry workshops next week uh, on Monday and Tuesday and another one on Thursday and Friday and I feel I filled both of those workshops within a week of acknowledging and I'm still getting people contacting me every day uh, wanting to, to attend so um, it, it's quite powerful and I think word spreads are the value of these courses and so that's why they've been uh, deemed quite popular but to, to really do a good virtual workshop, you need a very good video collaboration tool. Now at CQ University, we have an institutional license for Zoom, and so that's what we use for our uh, collaboration sessions. And one of the, the key fe um, features with Zoom, like uh, this webinar today, is that you can share the screen. So this then allows the instructor um, to, to see what's going on. Okay, and because you can see, you can actually help. But there is a particular functionality in Zoom that I think um, has made the world of difference. And that, um, I guess, feature is the ability to request remote control. Okay, and why that is important and why I found that to be quite valuable is that it really makes debugging and solving user issues exponentially faster. I mean, we've all had those sessions in a virtual where you know someone else is driving and you say, oh, look, click on the button. 
no, not that button, the one on the right and so forth. And that really takes um, time. And, you know, for these lessons to go smoothly, you want to reduce any time delay um, with it. So as someone who knows what they're doing and can scroll and navigate quite quickly, um, it then makes the actual session run very fast. So I use the request uh, remote control very, very often. I would probably on average remote control our participants' computers anywhere up to 50 times in a two-day workshop. So it's something that um, I use quite extensively. But something that occurred last year, which um, I must admit surprised me, and there's an assumption that I had wrong. And the assumption was that with these training uh, lessons and courses, we have um, a variety of attendees, everyone from those comfortable with programming, but also those who have never touched programming in their life before, and they're just getting started. And one of the assumptions I had was, I would think that those more advanced uh, programming type people would, um, I guess, get frustrated and bored at the slow pace of me helping the, the, the very, very beginner type uh, participants. But actually, I found that that wasn't the case. And what I actually found was that these more advanced people um, provided more of a peer mentoring um, and actually helped some of the users. And this really became into effect when um, we started collaboratively debugging to help solve uh, user issues. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But I've actually found that a lot of the advanced um, people still get a lot of value at and are actually happy to contribute and, and collaborate. So it's, it's, it's a really um, good environment. And this, I'll call it collaborative debugging. Uh, for want of a, a better term, but I actually believe, and, and um, I'm happy to, to discuss this uh, further, but I actually believe that a lot of some of the cases, it's better than what the face-to-face -face sessions give you. And I'll explain why. Um, you know, it's my opinion, and I've done, I've done many, that people think the face-to-face -face sessions are superior, you know, in the format. But I would actually argue, and that seeing the instructor solving issues remotely for everyone to see is a very powerful thing. So an example is that we have um, a user that's stuck. They go to run their program or whatever, and it's bringing up an error message and something like that. Now, the user might tell you what the error message is, but sometimes you actually need to see the code, see where it's stopped at and things like that to understand what the problem might be. So by me logging, you know, remotely connecting to a computer and controlling it, um, I can then scroll through, see the error message, highlight where the error is found, and sometimes it's very simple, and then actually show how it's fixed, and then moving on. So that gives a, a, a number of advantages. One is that it other users can see how I am remotely debugging and solving problems. Because a lot of the computing um, issues and problems is that there is syntax errors or bugs or whatever it might be that, um, you know, it takes a while to understand what all that means, particularly with new beginners. But when they see how I debug it, relate that to the issue, a lot of times when I'm solving that I'll have, so, for example, if I have 12 people in a session, I'll say, okay, how's everyone going? And two or three might be say, oh, it's not working, I've got a problem. So I'll remotely connect to one um, user. I fix it and over 50% of the time, someone will say, oh, actually, that was my problem too, okay? But not only does it fix the problem just there, but because people see the issue, nine times out of 10, they might face the same issue later through the workshop. And because they've seen it debugged, they actually then get an understanding on how to fix things and so forth. Um, the other thing too I found was that um, you'd get a lot more of the, um, I guess, extrovert people initially saying, hey, it's stuck, it's not working. 
and you know they weren't embarrassed if it's the most obvious or simple error. But by doing that and, and seeing me fix that, I've actually had people then who, you know, who are more quiet and shy actually say, oh, actually, Jason, I've got a problem too. And it, it brings people out of their shell. And through doing that, you get what I call a truly collaborative learning environment. And I think, you know, that is where, in my opinion, learning really um, has a, a big impact because they're not afraid to highlight that, hey, I've got a silly error message and I don't know how to fix it we can actually get that to work. So when people are sharing their screen, initially they're a bit hesitant, but if you get one or two people straight off the bat, um, highlight some simple errors, that then tends to engage everyone. But one of the things that um, I found in the sessions beneficial is not only do users see how I debug an issue, but actually sometimes some of the more advanced people would find the bug or issue before me. And so we actually had in cases a race of who could actually find the, the issue or bug first. And, you know, I don't mind if someone else highlights where the issue is before I find it. And thus it speeds up the pro, um, process, but it then engages those more advanced level people. And so that, you know, they're not just bored going over content that they already know, but they're actually helping to solve things. And, and so I've actually found that in my opinion, that is one of the, the best outcomes and, and benefits from a virtual style workshop where you're, you're more than peer programming, you're collaboratively, multiple people help working together, and you're highlighting learnings and solving problems. So I've talked a bit about um, you know, some of the, the benefits and using a good video collaboration tool and ensure that you get really good buying. Um, there, there is nothing worse than you know, people leaving or you have limited spaces and people miss out. But some of the other things I wanted to highlight that make um, virtual uh, workshops even better is the participants having dual screens. What I mean by that is that they have the two screens. One screen will be showing the video of the, the instructor, you know, seeing their code, seeing what's being typed and, and being able to follow it. And then the second screen for their work. I have had a number of people over the years uh, connect using a laptop. And whilst that is fine, um, they have to keep switching back and forth from what I'm doing to what they're doing. And so they tend to have more typos or more issues and so you know I do let all of my users know that hey if you can get access to using dual screens make a massive difference because they can then compare their code to my code and spot any little errors and things like that. Um, as well as that I find you know that there's always the, the more shy uh, type of uh, participants who don't um, like to see themselves on the screen and so I always get a few people that turn their video off. But if you can convince them to turn it on, it actually makes a difference. And where it makes a difference is it makes it easier to read the audience. So for example, in this webinar, okay, I cannot tell if people are understanding what I'm saying, if I'm going too fast or too slow or things like that. Whereas when I get people to turn on their video, you can read their body language and even if the people are saying, yeah, I'm good, you look at them and go, no, you're not actually, you're, you're stuck and let's help. Because if you can help those people um, get over those uh, minor issues, it then makes it a very uh, useful workshop and they get the most value out of it. Um, obviously, virtual workshops means that people can join from anywhere, okay? I have many of my users join from remote locations and particularly, you know, as long as there's a reasonable internet connection, okay, people can connect. I've had, I would say, at least 40 to 50% of my users connect to my sessions from home. Now they do this for many reasons, because they have home duties or, or you know, um, another thing, even though we have campuses throughout Australia, there are many of our, particularly RHD students, 
that are hundreds of kilometres away from our nearest campus. And so, you know, they need to learn all of this uh, material, but means that they can tend without having to travel. And so that actually has been a, a very big um, positive. So much so that um, for those who, who don't know, we also, particularly at QCIF, we run a lot of hacky hours. And it's either a weekly, fortnightly or, or monthly type session where people can bring their problems and um, you know people like myself and others can try and help. Um, this year I'll be running all of my hacky hours virtually only um, because I find I get a lot more people attend and I'm able to help more people. Um, I had one person join a virtual hacky hour from a hay bale shed out in the middle of a paddock. So, you know, if you allow them to attend, they will come. Um, and, and most importantly, it, it provides greater inclusivity to our workshops. You know, if there are no costs in travel and particularly accommodation and things like that, more people will, will want to attend and, and participate. The other thing too, and talking to my QCIF uh, colleagues, so QCIF, um, you know, has partners within most of the Queensland University. So James Cook University, CQ University, QUT, Griffith University, USQ, UQ, and so forth. But all of their, most of their sessions is run um, on campus. And some of the biggest issues they face is finding a physical room big enough to run these sessions in. The great thing about virtual is you don't have to worry about that. As long as you've got the technology, you can do it from anywhere. And so you don't have to worry about additional costs, room hire, catering, things like that. But because um, no travel is required, other organisations, other institutions and other groups can easily participate. So it really encourages broader participation. Something that I tried recently um, is that you know having two people run the session is better than one. Um, sounds obvious, but as someone who has always been a solo instructor, um, recently I had uh, one of my QCIF uh, colleagues, uh, Amanda Mayato from Griffith University slash QCIF, who actually attended the, the wor workshop as a remote helper. Now, what I found was that um, you know, while Amanda didn't actually cover the the content herself, she was able to answer some questions that I might not have known or or thought of at the time. Um, but the biggest value I found was that if we got a left field question, and obviously we want to encourage uh, you know interaction with our our colleagues is if I didn't know the answer, I couldn't just say to everyone, stop right there, give me five minutes to Google it, I can find the answer and get back to you. You know, because that really then stifles, um, you know, the actual teaching progress. So what it actually allowed Amanda to do was actually go and do that research, find the answer, come back and report back to the group whilst I kept presenting. And, you know, I found that invaluable. Um, because you're always going to get things that you don't know or can't answer at the time and you know without delaying everyone else you know someone could do that get back and answer for you. Um, I did have um, one or two um, remote students do that um, with me previously but having a online helper um, really made that quite valuable. So what about potential improvements? Where to from now? So some of the ideas that I guess I'm currently toying with is, is it possible to run a virtual session for a larger number of participants? You know, I'm always over um, the, the numbers and a waiting list. So, you know, if the more that I can actually uh, teach and, and help, in my opinion, is better. But you know, I can tell you now as a silo instructor, by the end of the second day, I am brain dead and I need to go home and crash and burn, you know, for a little while because it's it's quite exhausting mentally. 
Um, but you know, if you if we had um, instructors that you know multiple uh, instructors that w would um, go through the material, then you know, can we add in more users? As well as that, I know that Zoom has the sidebar functionality. So if you had a participant who was completely lost, completely stuck, and you know it's going to take more than a couple of minutes to help, could we use the sidebar where they go off into a side meeting, resolve the issues, and then come back? Haven't tried that before, um, but that is something that I'd like to, I guess, consider and test and see if it's um, uh, useful as well. Um, other ideas that have toyed and, and QCIF has mentioned to me um, is that you know, could we run this with satellite sites? So you have you know, four or five people at each site with a local helper. Um, the disadvantage with that is I think you lose some of that collaborative debugging, um, but you know, it, it comes down to um, you know, bang for buck. And if I could get 40 people participating, um, then you know, rather than 12, you know, there might be some, uh, I, I, I guess, negative impacts, but the greater, um, you know, overall getting as many people exposed and, and taught um, is, is quite important. So, if, if I guess I, you know, want to highlight this is that just because software carpentry is, you know, mostly always being done face to face. Um, you know, I'm happy to highlight and say that actually virtuals work quite well. Um, I've got a packed out workshop um, scheduled next week and um, I found it actually can work very well. So from there, I'm happy to, um, I guess, uh, um, open the audience to see if anyone's got any questions. Great, thank you very much for that, Jason. Uh, now we do have some questions already. Um, so the first question uh, for you, Jason, is do you keep the same two-day workshop format for your remote sessions? For example, do you have regularly scheduled breaks for morning tea, lunchtime and what have you? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the, the lessons um, plan and layout um, is a little bit fluid because sometimes you might get to a particular topic that's a bit harder and takes a bit longer but you might get through other topics a lot faster. So generally I have a, a, a schedule in which, you know, I, I map out when morning tea is, when lunch, um, and that's to give myself a break, not just the students. So yeah, absolutely, um, I, I have a, a schedule that I try to adhere by, but depending on how the workshop goes, sometimes we cover a little bit more content than I was hoping, and other times less. Great, thank you. Um, another question, uh, this time about your online hacky hours. Uh, for each hacky hour, do you have a topic or a theme? Um, no, at the moment, our, our virtual hacky hours is probably still a relatively new thing for us. Um, it's hacky hours has probably only been running at CQ University for about four to five or six months. So we're really just in the initial phase, but um, you know, I find I get more people actually participate because last year we had um, once a month a face-to-face -face in Rockhampton and then once a month a virtual. But I found that the face-to-face -face, not many people were attending but with the virtual a lot more. So instead of having to wait an entire month for someone to get help, they can now only have to wait two weeks and so that's the schedule that um, I'm planning to get started next month. Okay, sounds great. I'd, I'd love to learn more about that when you have more to tell me, or tell sure. us rather. Um, okay, another question. Uh, great advice for hosting sessions, uh, and I liked the dual monitor suggestion. Do you have any other tips for participants to help them get the most out of the virtual workshops? Um, good audio and uh, a webcam. Um, somewhere that you know, when they ask a question, they can be heard quite easily. Uh, sometimes people use just the built-in mic on a laptop and, and that, so it's a little bit more difficult to understand or they don't have an audio device at all. Um, I have in the past had to answer questions via the, the chat channel. So having a good, um, I guess, microphone and a, and a video device so we can see them uh, make, makes a big difference. Okay, great. 
Um, okay, another question has uh, just come in. Um, so you noted the usefulness of reading the student's body language uh, yes. to tell, for example, whether they're actually keeping uh, up or whether they're in trouble. Yep. Um, this particular person has uh, found that a major problem when they've done online teaching, despite most students having cameras, um, is that perhaps uh, they as presenter didn't have enough screen space to see all of the audience. Uh, how yep. many monitors do you have in front of you when you're teaching and, and what size are they? So, um, okay, um, I have, I'm very, very fortunate here, but I'll do a, a virtual tour, but I actually have a five screen setup. Now, it's multiple computers and so forth, but generally I use, my, I have a Mac, Windows and Linux machine and so forth, but generally I use a dual uh, window setup and, um, you know, I do have a, you know, part of a window particularly for seeing the participants. I always keep an eye on the chat because people answer questions or ask things as well there, particularly if they're not comfortable interrupting during the session, you know, um, as I'm covering a particular topic. So I have the chat there and then my slides and or, you know, whether I'm using a programming IDE like R Studio on one screen that I'm presenting. I would admit if I had a three screen setup where you could have one entire just for the audience, that would make things a bit better. But I do try and cram in a lot in the, the one screen. Okay, great. Um, now we... Um, oh, wait, the other thing I just thought of um, with that is, though I have these other screens, I do have one that I have looking at some of the content that I'll be covering shortly. So I can keep an eye on what's the next subject coming up, you know, what's coming so that, you know, it gets me in the, the mental preparation of what's next rather than just, you know, because I want to show if I'm doing a exercise, for example, I want to show on the screen that's the exercise we're working on uh, for people. But having another computer, iPad, whatever, that you can then scroll in on what's coming up next and what I'm going to cover in. And particularly if we're, we're um, I guess, lost a bit of time, I can then use that to see what bits I'm, I can skip just so that we, we keep things on track. So I find that quite useful as well. Okay, great. Uh, another question. Now, you, you did mention at the beginning of the talk that you require your attendees to have all the software installed before they yep. join. Uh, otherwise, sure. they run the risk of being blacklisted from training. Um, yep. What kind of support do you offer then pre-workshop? So you mentioned that they do get in touch with you if they have any yep. troubles. So a lot of times I just point them to the software carpentry setup because um, there's always a, a, a section dedicated that what they need to do to set up and get running. About 80% normally do that without any issues. But the 20% sometimes, um, and, and one of the biggest with our RHD students is they don't have admin rights to install software on it and so forth. So normally they might get help from field services or a help desk uh, to do a little bit of that. And then probably 5% of users, I might get on and, and help them just to get over the mark because you always get one or two uh, machines that are a little bit different and quirky and you know, something that's uh, not obviously easily fixed. Okay, great. Uh, some more uh, questions around the logistics of your, of your own setup. So um, you did mention that you um, don't necessarily need to uh, book a room or anything to deliver from. Uh, and sure. I am curious, I see that there are chairs behind you. Um, do you share your office with other people and are they very... Oh, I'm very fortunate that I have an office to myself and it is a very big office, so very, very lucky. Um, but no, it is important that you have a room that you can be loud, you know, talking and, and not have any interruption. So I actually find that even participants trying to participate in an open plan environment um, can be sometimes a little bit difficult. So if they can move into a quiet space or whatever where they can you know, listen in and participate and do, that seems to, to work reasonably well. But I think it's vitally important for the, the instructor to have no 
you know, external noises or things like that that can make the uh, session you know, um, disruptive. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, another question about, uh, and this is back to the, um, the the sort of workshop format and timetable. So sure. um, with CQU being across all of Australia, and there's a number of time zones to consider there, um, yes. do you make any allowance for, say, somebody in Western Australia who is two hours behind you? Um, generally, um, the answer is no. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's a case of, well, if they had to come over to a Queensland or something like that, they would have to work in our time zone anyway. And, you know, sometimes I, I have things where people uh, may miss the first hour, but we have things, I've got one person that's going to miss the first hour, but they've, they've got everything set up, they're going to do the first two chapters that we cover, and everything then allows them to join in and participate that way. But generally speaking, um, you know, with most times, you know, I, I do it from about nine to four thirty um, Queensland time, and and generally, you know, that allows people well if they have to start at eight or something like that, it's still, you know, not too bad. Uh, I'm sorry if your exact question um, doesn't get answered um, because we do only have limited time. Um, but if your exact question hasn't been answered, feel free to follow up with me or Jason uh, after this session. Um, okay, so um, a question about the remote. Highlight, this is my schedule that I have for one of my sessions next week. And there are the, the sort of rough timings and so forth that I have for the sessions. Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I suppose then with the um, earlier starts for people who are west of you, I mean, an advantage is they can attend from home and it's a little yes. easier to start earlier from home than and, it is and, if and you have to go to go find parking, drive somewhere and, and get your coffee and get ready. And that is something that I do find is that you know, a number of the people do join from home because whether it's time zone or anything else like that. Yeah, OK. Now, uh, We've got one minute, so one final question, um, and this is about the the remote control. Um, so there's a question just asking you to clarify a little bit. So uh, with the remote control, does that mean that the students share their screen, you spot their problems and you ask them to make changes, or do you really have full control so, over their so computer with, and you can type and everything? So, so within Zoom, um, how it works is that I'll stop sharing my screen and they will share their screen. Once they're sharing, I can press a button that says request remote control. They then click on a button to allow and I can take full control of the computer. So it actually, you know, I can scroll down, zoom. So, so rather than sometimes getting them to type commands or click on buttons or whatever, you know, I, I actually can control it on their computer um, itself. And again, if they have a reasonable internet connection, it's actually quite um, quick and uh, responsive. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And with that, we are now out of time. Um, so I uh, would like to thank everybody for attending and I would especially like to thank you, Jason, for uh, taking uh, 45 minutes out of your very busy teaching schedule um, to run this webinar. Uh, this session has been recorded and it will be made available on YouTube uh, shortly after we've done some editing. Uh, so please share it with your colleagues um, and, and friends. Um, so, thank you again, Jason, and have a great day. Thank you very much for everyone's attendance, and thank you for ARDC for giving me this opportunity to, to tell my story. So, thank you. Bye.